Hey everyone, and welcome to part six in our sermon series, Hidden Motives. Today we're going to be discussing shame and how shame can motivate us both overtly and covertly. And we're going to talk about some strategies for dealing with it and keeping it from corrupting our worship unto God. So Lord, I pray that you would bless this time, that you would illuminate the word to us, that you would direct my words, and Lord, that you would have the glory in all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to start by looking at the first instance of shame in the Bible, and this is Genesis 3, verses 6 through 12. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. There's a lot to unpack here, um, and one thing I think that's interesting is that shame was not the result of God finding them. Shame was something that Adam experienced and Eve experienced on their own, and it caused them to hide from God. First, um, let's talk about the definition of shame. What do we mean by shame? So um, the Hebrew word for shame is shimsa which means scornful whispering of hostile spectators. So it's interesting because if you think about it, you know, number one, it's scornful. That makes sense. Uh, it's condemning. You know, it's, it's something negative being spoken over us, but they're describing it in this Hebrew word as whispering. So shame by nature can be subtle. You know, in the sermon series, we're exploring hidden motives and how we can be motivated by things not of God when we should be motivated by his agape love. Um, and so, you know, shame can be subtle. It can be a whispering and of hostile spectators. So it's, it's the feeling like you were being watched, you know, hence the shame of being naked, you know, not wanting to be seen for what you are and found wanting or not wanting to be exposed for the things that you have done wrong. And so their attempt to deal with their shame was to cover up, you know, and, um, and to hide. But at the end of the day, you know, was the covering of fig leaves sufficient? Absolutely not. It didn't do anything. God knows everything. He knows everywhere that we are. Read Psalm 139. It talks about, you know, he knows where we, where we lay down, where we rise. Um, you know, you can't hide in the depths or in the darkness from him. He sees everything and he knows the depths of our sin. So shame pushed them to behave irrationally in trying to cover up and hide from God. Um, and you might think, well, that's ridiculous, but we're going to talk about some ways that we do the same thing. Before we do that, though, bearing in mind the definition of shame from the Hebrew, let's talk about shame uh, as contrasted to some legitimate things that can be mistaken for shame, because we're trying to target um, ungodly, sinful motives, and um, one way to do that is to um, contrast them with things that are actually good, but may be mistaken for them. So, Let's begin by looking at um, shame versus humility. So shame is actually a manifestation of pride. You know, that's one way to look at it, the two sides of the same coin, because both are preoccupied with self. And we actually discussed this in an earlier installment of this teaching series where we were talking about pride. Um, but um, here's a good quote from C.S. Lewis that sort of helps differentiate between shame and humility. So C.S. Lewis says this, humility is not thinking less of yourself, that would be shame, it's thinking of yourself less. So if you think about it, um, you know, shame is preoccupied with self. It's running and hiding from God because it's saying that your sins are so great, your badness is so great that God can't use you and he can't overcome it. He can't work with it. Um, whereas humility says basically, um, you know, I am lowly and I'm messed up, but God is so great that he can overcome it. He can deal with it so I can be open with him about my problems, about my failures, about my sins, and trust that in his greatness, 
he can do exceedingly and abundantly more with my life than I could ask or want. What humility does is it comes to God like a little boy with the loaves and the fishes. And it says, here's all I have. <laughs> and, you know, maybe with an awareness that the boy didn't have, we might say, well, it's not much, it's lacking, it's insignificant, but Jesus, I trust you to take all of my weakness and make your strength perfect in it, to express your greatness through my lack, you know, and even in spite of my sin, to work around it and, and, and to heal me of it and to use me despite my darkness and my failure and my insufficiency. And, um, and so really, you know, shame says my problems are bigger than God's ability, but then humility says God's ability is so much greater than my problems that he can use even me. He can work with even me, and I can therefore approach him with confidence because the thing that tips the scales is him and not me. Another thing we need to um, understand uh, about shame and another thing to differentiate it from is um, uh, conviction. And so God does not want us to walk in shame, but he does convict, rebuke, and discipline his children. So um, John 16, 8 says this, and when he has come, this is Jesus referring to the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. So we know one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict. And so we need to accept when he convicts us, and that's different from shame. Um, so, you know, you might feel conviction from your sins, um, but that's not the flesh giving you that if it's actually from the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a difference. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in just a moment. So Revelation 3.19 says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And chasten, you could substitute that with discipline, really. Um, therefore, be zealous and repent. And so, you know, um, it actually says elsewhere that God's kindness in, leads us to repentance. And so, you know, he rebukes and chastens us. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Like, don't, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Be zealous in your repentance, too. Um, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, and you, excuse me, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening, aka discipline, of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens, um, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. That's pretty powerful in itself. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Remember, one of the things about agape love is that it seeks not its own. It's actually expressing itself for the benefit of others. There's a selflessness to God's love. And so here he says that for our profit, he disciplines us. That's very different from um, condemnation and self-condemnation because those are unto death. Those are saying this is a final assessment of you and you can't profit from it. You can't overcome it. You are stuck there. That's, that's your fate. So continuing in this Hebrews passage, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So again, it's for our profit, it's for our good. Um, and so we need to also understand God does not condemn, and he also doesn't torment his children. So Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So if you're in Christ Jesus, guess what? No condemnation. So the self-condemnation that shame causes you to experience, you know, that's unto death, basically. That's saying, you know, you're worthless and you're going to stay that way. Um, that's your problems are bigger than God's grace. And um, that's not what he gives us. He gives us a chastening, which is for our profit. And, um, and so in a conviction, which leads us to repentance so that we can grow and be healed and have a right relationship with him. So God will cause us to feel, you know, the guilt of sin but in a way that's actually for our profit. It's part, of, it's part of him bringing us into righteousness. And here's a really critical verse for understanding all this. 1 John 4, 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So think about the fig leaves. Think about Adam and Eve running and hiding from God. You know, they were afraid of the torment. They were dealing with the condemnation, the inner torment. But what God does is those who are walking with him, those who are 
um, you know, who have given their, themselves to Jesus, trusting in him for salvation. He clothes us in his righteousness, and, um, and he allows us to approach him and experience his perfect love that actually casts out fear. We don't have to fear torment from God. You know, if, you, if you've given your life to him, um, then, you know, you, you will still have a healthy fear of the Lord because he is holy, and no flesh will glory in his presence. You're not going to be eager to sin in God's presence because, you know, if you're in right relationship with him, that will hurt your heart, and his Holy Spirit will convict you for your good, for your profit, as we read earlier. Um, nevertheless, when we sin and we repent, we can come to him with confidence. We can boldly approach the throne of grace because he is not going to condemn us once we have given our lives to him. And, um, and we don't need to fear torment from him. When he comes, or when we come to him and, and genuinely repent, he's, he separates you know, the memory of our sins. It's like, it's like as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. It talks about him basically hurling our, our sins into the sea, you know, um, the distance of being on the ocean floor. And so we don't need to worry about going to him after we've repented and him tormenting us with, oh yeah, you're never going to amount to anything because of that thing that you did. Yeah, you repented of it, but no, that's who you are and you're just going to stay that way. He doesn't do that. That's the kind of thing we do to ourselves in shame and in self-condemnation, but that's not what he does. All right, so let's talk about some ways that shame will motivate us. And um, I've kind of categorize these into two groups. One of them is ways shame motivates us when we know that we've failed. Um, and another is ways that shame motivates us when we want to avoid failure or avoid admitting failure. So first of all, when we know we failed, shame will um, motivate us toward isolation. And so we see that with, again, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, they hid, they hid from God. And it can be isolation from God, trying not to hear his voice, trying not to experience his conviction, which is very dangerous because if you avoid listening to the conviction of the Holy Spirit long enough, you can have a seared conscience um, where you're, you're not sensitive uh, to his conviction. And eventually, in any particular matter, he may basically say, okay, time's up, you haven't repented, now I'm going to deal with you with discipline. Um, so... Um, it can also lead us to isolate ourselves from the truth of Scripture or even just particular passages that convict us. You know, if you're dealing with a particular sin in your life and saying either, oh, no, that's not wrong, or I'm just going to act like that's not in the Bible, you know, those things are dangerous. Um, embrace the whole truth of the Word, the totality of the Word, even the things that are convicting and inconvenient. Um, and one of the things that's really critical to understand is that God wants us to be in relationship. You know, the contrast was before they would be naked and unashamed in the garden and walk with God in the cool of the day, you know, nothing hidden. And then afterward, there was an, an immediate consequence to their intimacy with God. They wanted to hide from him. They wanted to cover up. And so, you know, the closeness of our walk with God is corrupted when we give in to the shame, you know, because we hide from him. And so, you know, they would have these, these conversations with God. They would walk with him in the cool of the day. There was nothing separating them from him. And then, you know, shame caused them to run from him. It's very interesting. And even when we're, you know, as believers, um, it's like you, you still, when you're dealing with shame, you push God away. You avoid fellowship with him if you can, you know, and it's not that he goes anywhere, but you're creating a distance between you and him. Um, so we can also experience isolation from others as a result of shame. So hiding from community or accountability or leadership who can call you out on your sin, that's a really dangerous thing. You know, we have a culture of church hopping, um, you know, and it's, it's fine, I think, to participate in a lot of different ministries, but I think it's very valuable to have somewhere, in fact, I would say critical, to have somewhere where you are accountable and people can call you out for your sin. Um, and a lot of the time, people will be engaged in a sin, and someone in their church will call them out, although even that's not common enough anymore. There is such a thing as church discipline. Go and read 1 Corinthians. You'll find out about that. Um, but, um, but then when they're called out, rather than repenting, they instead rebelliously, they'll isolate from that community and go to another one and possibly experience the same thing there and just hop around and never really plant because they don't want to be found out. You know, they don't want to be um, assessed by those around them. And we might not just do this when we are guilty of something. We might also avoid getting too close to a leader or um, a community or um, anyone who can provide accountability in our lives because even if we haven't sinned in a way we're aware of, we don't want to be found out for either sinning or just failing or, or just being, you know, insufficient. Like, 
I've I've met lots of people and even been um, fairly close to some who, you know, um, their their pattern has been that they they meet you and they tell you all these great things about their personal walk with God. But one thing that you don't see is you don't see them remaining in a community where other people can evaluate their lives and speak into it when they have a deficiency, when they have a sin, when they have anything like that. And so oftentimes, you know, these people, they just wander around and they don't really have real relationships with people because they don't want to be discovered. They don't want to be weighed and measured. And they certainly don't want to be, um, you know, close to anybody who might be more spiritual than them, <laughs> you know, who might have a more impressive walk or more impressive fruit in their life, you know, and, um, and sometimes these people, you know, they'll, they'll talk about all the great things that they've done with God and, you know, all this other stuff and really bolster themselves up. Um, but if you know them long enough, sometimes you'll see that they run away after they commit some great disaster, you know, some, some grievous error of judgment. But if instead you, you submit yourself to a community. You submit yourself to potentially correction and leadership and and uh, being discipled by others. You know, finding people who you say, um, I want to be more like them in this way or that way or another way. Like that can be so profitable for your growth. Um, but if instead you just don't ever enter into that because you're afraid of being found out, that can be dangerous. All right. <clears throat> so um, another way that shame can motivate us when we know that we have done wrong is denial. Um, shame can motivate us to enter into denial. Um, and so uh, one way is just by putting on a front of holiness when we know that we're not holy or possibly even deceiving ourselves into thinking we are, but focusing on the appearance, you know. Um, and this is definitely something that happens a lot in, you know, kind of Sunday morning Christianity, showing up and appearing like everything is fine and, and just not being real with anyone. Um, and uh, here's what Jesus said to the Pharisees um, in Matthew 23, 7 through 8, 27 through 8. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Wow. <laughs> Harsh words. And um, don't be like that. You know, when you have a real problem, go to God with it, and don't be afraid to go to people with it. Be wise about whom you go to it. Don't, you know, don't uh, necessarily take everybody into a place of confidence, you know, things like that. But, um, but, you know, have genuine repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And I say this especially, like, you know, for anybody considering ministry leadership, you know, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That's, a, that's one of the commands in the Word. And, um, you know, in, if instead you try to um, produce fruit in keeping with appearances, you know, well, guess what? You know, those whitewashed tombs will attract a lot of attention and God can still use them. He can still do a lot of good through them, you know, even if only in response to the hunger of the people flocking to those, those whitewashed tombs. But in the end, their ministry will self-destruct, their character will be exposed. And, and all those things that they wanted to remain hidden, guess what? When they self-destruct, it's all going to be out there very publicly. So um, it's a time bomb. It's a, it's a disastrous way of going about things. Tend the inner life. And as it says in the word, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. All right. <clears throat> now, another thing, this is related to denial, but um, shame will cause us to minimalize and rationalize our sins away. Um, here's an exa example from uh, 1 Samuel 15, when um, God commanded Saul to destroy the Amalekites and just wipe everything out, not to take any of the possessions or anything. And uh, in verse 9 it says, But Saul and the people spared Agag, who's the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So they destroyed what was worthless, but they kept the best stuff for themselves. God told Samuel about this and told him to confront the king. And so in verses 13 through 15, Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That's an outright lie. He didn't perform the command of the Lord, but he's putting on this, this um, bold face in denial. Um, but Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Verses um, 20 through 23. And Saul said to Samuel, 
But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the, Amalek, the Amalekites. So he's even changing his definitions in, in the denial. You know, it's like when Samuel convicts him, he says, oh, I did what God said, except I did this. And then he, he says in the same sentence, I did it and I did these things. So he's, he's even deceiving himself with his definitions in order to appear righteous to Samuel. And Samuel's response is rather amazing. I'll read it. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And we talked about that verse in, in, in discussing um, rebellion as well. They're all related. A lot of these things are very intermingled. Um, but um, it's, it's profound how much we will deny um, we'll lie to ourselves. We'll redefine things. We'll, we'll, um, you know, not face, um, what's really happening. And that's so dangerous, especially when we do it with the word, with the commands of God in the word, you know, it talks about how basically when a man looks at the word and doesn't see, um, you know, doesn't get convicted, you know, it says he's like a man who looks into a mirror and immediately forgets what his face looks like. Um, it's dangerous <laughs> and we don't want to be like that. You know, denial can cause us to use even the power of the word in a way that it becomes impotent to our lives, not because the word is weakened, but because we're not applying it. Um, or worse yet, we're applying it to vindicate ourselves rather than, um, allowing in humility God to convict us. All right. So another thing that we definitely see is that, um, blame occurs, you know, when we're experiencing shame. So, um, uh, it was actually in the last passage. Um, I skipped the verse, but now I'll go back and read it. Um, Saul says, uh, but the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things which should have been utterly, should have been utterly destroyed. So he goes from this um, just denial to, okay, well, yes, but the people did it, you know, and, um, and we, uh, we see something similar with Moses and Aaron with the golden calf, you know, he says, you know, do not be angry, Moses. Um, the people brought me their stuff and I tossed into the fire and out came this calf, you know, um, but we even see it in the original um, incident of shame in the Bible in Genesis 3. Um, when confronted about what happened, Adam says, the woman you gave me took and gave me the fruit and I ate. So blame causes us to not operate, you know, it, it's, it's like when we experience shame, not only do we not operate in the agape love, you know, in terms of how we deal with ourselves and God, but we also will go very much against it and seek our own, even to the point of blaming others. We often do that in ways we're not even very aware of, um, or we do it so quickly, it's like a knee-jerk reaction, like a reflex, and then you're like, oh, wait a second, did I just do that? You know, using somebody else as a shield, uh, and essentially using somebody else's fig leaves, you know, for your sin. It's terrible, but check yourself for that, because, you know, how often do you do it, whether um, subtly or obviously, and, um, and be aware of how quickly you do it, how much of a reflex it is for you to do it, because the more prone you are to doing it, the faster you do it, probably the more shame you deal with. So, um, and then another thing that, um, when you're aware of your own sin, um, it can actually lead to just downright accusation that's not even related to yourself, you know? So, um, there's actually a, a, a an understanding in, in psychology I, that basically when you are preoccupied with your own problem, you know, let's say you have an addiction or something, uh, or you just really have trouble overcoming, you know, your tendency toward a particular vice or particular character flaw, when you see it in other people, you immediately come down hard on them. You know, um, a good example is like sometimes people who are excessively condemning, um, you know, of somebody for, um, you know, um, I don't know, lying, it might be that they're liars, or maybe they're excessively condemning of other people for, um, you know, being indecent in some way. It might be that they're actually really struggling with their own immorality, you know, and, um, and so very often the person who, you know, kind of cries foul the loudest is the one who's actually dealing with that, that sin the most. And why? Well, it's because fig leaves, you're covering up your own sin by saying, well, look at that person. He's so much worse, you know, and a lot of evangelists will, will ask people, you know, are you going to go to heaven? And they'll say, yeah, I'm a good person. And, and they say, well, how do you know? And they say, well, I haven't murdered, you know, I'm not Hitler. And so basically it's saying, well, I'm a good person because I'm better than these things, which I haven't done, or I'm better than this person who has done, you know, worse things than me. And so we find scales of comparison, 
you know, and we condemn others in order to elevate ourselves. And this can be um, something that happens in, in even in like in ministry, you know, people can be in bitter rivalry against each other to be better than each other because they're insecure and they actually just want to feel um, that that criticism, that inner critic that they're dealing with, they just want to have a moment's peace and project it onto somebody else and hopefully other people are listening and will criticize the other person instead of criticizing themselves. Remember the definition in the Hebrew of shame is like the whispering of, uh, the scornful whispering of spectators. You know, you feel like everybody around you when you're dealing with shame, you feel like everybody around you is, is scorning you and criticizing you. But guess what? They're probably not. And so you don't need to deflect their criticism to somebody else because it's probably not there in the first place. Um, and it doesn't work with God. <laughs> you can't, you can't um, point to somebody else, you know, and, and, and um, come off easier with God as a result. You know, there's a good example of that. In Luke 18, verse 11, Jesus tells a parable about um, a tax collector and a Pharisee praying at the temple. And um, he says this, um, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. So he goes on then to, to talk about all the good things he does, but he's trying to get off with God, you know, present himself as righteous to God by comparing uh, himself with somebody else in order to condemn them. You know, how selfish is that? How, you know, it, it doesn't work with God at all. Um, and so we can do it defensively. We can accuse others defensively because we want to seem better in our own eyes than them. But we can also do it um, offensively where, you know, it's not even to protect ourselves. We just, we are just so preoccupied with our self-condemnation, with our own shame, that when we see God respond positively to somebody who we think are, is worse than us, then we end up just going into, conf you know, accusation and, and anger, even at God, you know, um, for accepting them, you know, bitterness that they're being treated well, um, and essentially being treated better than we would treat ourselves if we were in their condition. Um, so one quick example would be in uh, Luke 7 verses 36 through 50, Jesus is at um, dinner at uh, Simon the Pharisee's house, and a woman um, who has a terrible reputation comes and is worshiping him and, you know, washing his feet with her hair and weeping. And, um, and so in verse 39, uh, it says, now when the Pharisee uh, who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, referring to Jesus, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner. And so he couldn't stand that Jesus would accept someone so bad, you know? And does that benefit Simon at all to accuse her? Not really. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, he's, he's incensed, you know, probably because he's got this inner critic within himself, you know, Simon, you're so bad and you have to work so hard for God to accept you. And then wait a second, God accepted her. This isn't fair. You know, you see, you see how this works. So now we've assessed uh, a few ways that shame can motivate us to behave when we know that we failed or have the feeling that we failed. You know, it can cause us to isolate, um, to deny our sins. It can cause us to um, uh, blame others, to engage in accusation against others. Um, and um, now let's talk about some ways that it can cause us to defend ourselves from failure. You know, to avoid failing or the feelings of failure is probably more accurate. Um, so number one is perfectionism. So if you are dealing with a lot of shame, um, it can make you a perfectionist. And so an overachieving perfectionist or an underachieving perfectionist, you might be thinking, well, wait a second, I thought there was only one type. No, there's actually at least those two. So if you are overachieving, you're basically trying to always succeed and never face any failure. Um, and this can lead to just like a maddening drivenness and an inability to enjoy life or even celebrate your successes. You know, I've dealt a lot with this. And, um, uh, you know, especially like in my, um, kind of early teen years and God very, um, you know, drastically kind of apprehended me and confronted it. But, but especially back then, um, you know, no matter what I did, I never celebrated because as soon as I was done, I was thinking of the next thing I had to achieve, you know, and, and for somebody like that, for somebody dealing with that, you know, you're, you're only defined by your last success, you know, and, and every time you have another opportunity to, to succeed, it's an opportunity to fail. And if you fail, then it's almost like the slate of all your successes is washed clean in your, in your heart and in your mind. You just hang on to whatever the last thing is. And that's a terrible way to le live. It's a, it's a slavish way to live. Um, and so, um, you know, we talked about uh, a little bit about um, something called narcissism when we were dealing with uh, 
the uh, installment in the sermon series about pride. And so a narcissist is terribly insecure and preoccupied with, with proving to everyone else how great they are because of their insecurity. And there's one kind called a grandiose narcissist. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll just, oh, look at me. I have all these great things. Look at the, the, you know, expensive car I drive. Look at my wonderful career. Look at my, you know, perfect appearance, all this stuff. They're, um, and they just flaunt it, you know, and that kind of person could be a perfectionist and wanting to flaunt their accomplishments and their achievements in order to be seen. But they could also be a more subtle kind of nar narcissist um, that I mentioned before in the other episode uh, where I addressed this called a social narcissist. And the social narcissist will, you know, in potentially a way that seems very Christian, <laughs> you know, serve others and put themselves in the lowest place and, you know, appear to be very humble and very others focused, but it's actually so that they can be seen and acknowledged for their good deeds. And so, you know, that can be the type of perfectionist that you become. And that's dangerous too, you know, where you're competing to be the best at being the last, you know? And, um, and so that can be a, a, a terrible perversion of the gospel where you're, you're just flipping things on your head and you're not really doing it out of agape love. You're doing it because you want to serve yourself. And, um, you know, as I posited back in the other teaching where I addressed this, you know, I said, well, what happens if, you know, there's an opportunity for those people to be served better by somebody else and you need to bow out so that somebody else can do a better job? Would you do it and say, thank you, Lord, that those people are going to be served better by this expert in the field? Or are you going to say, you know, whether admitting it to yourself or not, oh no, now I have to do something else to validate myself, to prove myself, you know, to, to upstage these people who are moving in and, and, and actually serving better than me. And, you know, um, I heard a description of the social narcissist this way. They'll throw all these galas and fundraisers and things like that. And it might be they spend $10,000 on the fundraiser and raise $10,500 and give 500 to the poor. And then if you confront them and say, well, why didn't you just give $10,000 to the poor? And they say, oh, no, no, I, I really need to have my, my gala. I need to have my fundraiser, my big show, because that's what they're really after. They don't really care about the people they're serving. Um, it's actually just about assuaging their own insecurities, you know? And so I addressed that before when talking about pride, but I'm also addressing it now when talking about shame, because remember, shame and pride are basically the same thing. They're a preoccupation with self. One that you're so great, the other that you're so terrible. All right, so um, there's also the possibility <clears throat> that you become an underachieving perfectionist in order to avoid failure. And this is fascinating to me. So, you know, a perfectionist can't be a perfectionist in every area. The, the people who appear to be perfect at everything, well, they might have one room in their house that's always messy if the rest of it is clean. And guess what? That's gonna be their back closet where nobody goes. And, um, you know, in the same way, like you can't be perfect at everything without having some slack in some area or another. And so you're always gonna have areas where you fail. Um, they just might not be public. And an underachieving perfectionist will actually do this. They will instead say, well, I would rather, rather than trying to be perfect and failing and being proved wrong, instead I'm gonna make up excuses and never try in the first place. They might end up becoming another kind of a narcissist, um, which is called the covert narcissist. And the covert narcissist, instead of talking about how great they are, they'd say, oh, I would have been great except that this bad thing happened to me. Or, you know, look at this person's success, it's wonderful, I wish I had a great chance like that. You know, they victimize themselves instead of flaunting their achievements and in victimizing themselves, they try to get pity and, you know, positive attention. Oh no, you're actually, you're not, you're, you're actually really great, you know, um, things like that, reassurance. Um, but they also try to just not um, experience the, the, the pain and the shame of trying and failing, you know, better not to enter the race than not to get first place is kind of the attitude. And so this is how God deals with that. <laughs> Take a look at um, Matthew 25 verses 14 through 30, um, where Jesus gives the parable of the talents. And one of the servants, he gives one talent to, and they're all charged, invest your talent, you know, or, or basically cause it to reap a return. And in, in when I come back, you know, I'll, I'll have more because of how you stewarded the talent I gave you. And so the last servant um, is addressed here in verses 24 through 26, and it continues beyond that, but I'll just do these verses. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. And then he continues with even more condemning words, you know. Um, and so this is a situation where the man did not actually commit his life to God. He did not actually give what God gave him back to God. You know, he was living selfishly 
And he was, you know, basically justifying it um, by saying, God, you're a hard man, you know. Um, and so rather than failing, <laughs> I am going to instead just just give you back what you gave me exactly without actually making an investment. You know, that's the equivalent of living your life with zero fruit and showing up and saying, okay, here I am, you know. And so he was called out for his sin, you know. Um, and so it would have been better if he had tried and failed. It would have been better if he had tried and only produced a little bit instead of being like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to take my one talent and, and produce less than these other two servants and be compared negatively to them. You know, if you, if you try that, that kind of covert narcissist path or that um, underachieving perfectionist path of saying, well, I'm just going to make up excuses and I'm not going to try, well, that is once again an act of self. That's, that's putting your uh, insufficiency above God's ability to use your loaves and fishes and to make his strength uh, expressed perfect in your weakness. And so he knew God to be a hard man. You know, he knew him to be a hard man. But if we actually know his love, that will compel us to serve with boldness and to not be afraid to mess up. You know, he knows our heart and he'll rebuke and correct and train and equip, but in love and for our profit. And he will not condemn us simply for trying and failing when we're, you know, really trying, you know, when we're, when we're really, um, when our heart is in the right place and he can use that humble offering of you really giving it your all, even when you have so little to give, even when you only have the one talent. And so this man was not doomed to fail, but he chose failure by not participating in the first place. We can't do that. All right. So, um, another thing that we can do to avoid feeling like failures, we can be motivated out of shame into legalism. And so legalism is a form of perfectionism, sort of a moral perfectionism. You know, I'm going to do everything in the law of God perfectly. And that really leads us um, to, you know, those negative things that we uh, talked about before of when you are found out for your sin, you know, blaming others because you can't bear the consequences of getting one little jot or tittle of the law wrong, you know, and, um, and it can cause you to accuse and condemn others so that you appear holier to yourself and to others than the other people around you. And the Pharisees were full of this, you know, the legalism that they, um, you know, that they engaged in. Jesus talked about how, you know, they, they searched the scriptures and couldn't find Jesus himself, you know, um, and they would, they would strain out gnats and swallow camels, you know, he said figuratively about how they would treat the law. And, you know, all of these things, they just totally missed the point because all they wanted was to be legalistically righteous. They just wanted to check off every list so they could be, you know, faultless, so they could be perfect, so they couldn't be condemned. But they missed the whole heart of the word. They missed God himself. And one of the symptoms of legalism is that it can drive you to a place where you cannot recognize God, especially as he expresses himself in grace and in mercy, because you have not received those from him yourself. Instead, you've chosen your harsh standard and you've centered your whole universe around that idolatrously and projected it onto everybody else because you're dealing with it yourself constantly. So legalism is a dangerous place. Um, and we can address, um, you know, the idea of living according to God's uh, commandments. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands and actually trying to do them well, you know, striving for, you know, doing them rightly and as perfectly as you can. Those things are biblical ideas in and of themselves, you know, and here's some verses behind that. Philippians 2.12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your, sal your own salvation with fear and trembling. All right, so yes, work hard toward you know, actually work out your salvation and with fear and trembling, my goodness. So be serious about it, you know? Yes. And Luke 13, 24, Jesus himself says, strive to enter through the narrow gate for many, I say, will seek to enter and will not be able. Philippians three twelve, Paul says, not that I have already attained or am per already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. So we do need to press on, you know, toward the perfection of God. And in Colossians 3.23, it says, And whatever you do, do it heartily, or in another translation, with all your heart, as to the Lord and not to men. So, you know, take that and then the command to love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the greatest commandment according to Jesus. Um, you know, to do those things, you got to work hard, all right? You, and, and that can look like perfectionism in some ways, and that can look like legalism in some ways, but there is a critical difference. And the critical difference comes down to this. 
you cannot work yourself unto salvation. So if you are trying to work to avoid condemnation and you know, then, then you're doing it for completely the wrong reason and you're only going to fail. So here's some verses about that. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Some people are so preoccupied with not sinning. And again, you, you, you want to, as an expression of love, avoid sin at all costs. But they're so preoccupied that instead of saying, when they actually do sin, instead of saying, all right, I admit it and Father, forgive me, um, and receiving that grace by which we are saved. Instead, they say, no, I haven't sinned. Of course not. Why, why would I sin? I, I'm too holy for that. Look at that person. He's sinning. Go, go condemn him instead, you know? But an awareness of your sin is critical to receiving salvation. A lot of people never give their lives to God because they don't understand that they're sinful. They can't admit it. Um, and they don't want to be saved by grace. They want to work into their salvation <laughs> because, you know, then they could feel like they could boast. But, but Paul says, um, again, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know, remember how I said shame and pride are really the same thing? Well, you want to avoid feeling shame for your sin. You want to do that in part so that you can boast in your righteousness, you know? <laughs> but that, that's the, the antithesis of the gospel. The gospel says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we need that perfect uh, grace from God, that gift. Um, we cannot earn it. Isaiah 64, 6 says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Righteousness is, that's a hard word, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities, which means willful sins, like the wind have taken us away. You know, we need the grace. Otherwise, we're just taken away by our sins. Um, Philippians uh, 3, 6 um, through 11, um, starting uh, in the middle of verse 6, it says, Concerning zeal, and this is Paul talking about himself, kind of his own resume of righteousness, you know. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. So all of his righteous credentials, you know, being blameless according to the law of the Pharisees, you know, um, being kind of a perfect Pharisee, you know, and having all these other advantages, he counts it as nothing that he may know Christ. Better to just reject all of that and instead depend on God's grace for your salvation, because that actually works. Um, and it comes with the joy of knowing him, you know, not being like that, that servant who misunderstands him as a hard man, but actually knowing him and receiving his love and his grace um, and his kindness that leads you to repentance. Do you want to live holy and righteous? Don't try to do it in your own strength because you need to accept that rebuke from the Lord, that conviction from the Lord, so you'll actually know his kindness as he rebukes you and disciplines you and trains you in righteousness. And if you don't do that, you won't know his kindness. And that kindness is what leads you to repentance and draws you in. You know, you're going to be so much more motivated toward a holy life if you're like King David, where when he sinned grievously and wrote about it in Psalm 51, his plea to God included um, the phrase, restore to me the joy of your salvation. So David was crushed and broken by his sin, not just because of the acts or the consequences to himself or others, but because of the chief consequence of not walking in the pleasure of intimacy with God, of hiding in the bushes with his fig leaves, you know, for a time because of his sin. And he wanted that joy of his salvation restored. Be addicted like David to the presence of God so that when you are dealing with sin, you say, nope, not worth it, not worth grieving God, or even experiencing a moment's separation from him as I run away. <laughs> so, you know, fight back the temptation to sin with the superior pleasure of God, and that will produce real holiness in your life. You know, that will really motivate you. Whereas if you're just doing it legalistically, then what you do is you dry up and you become this bitter, withered husk, like the older brother in the, the story of the prodigal son, you know, where he, where he can't rejoice when the younger brother receives grace. But those who, who serve and choose holiness out of love for God, they know his heart and they rejoice in the joy of his father's heart when the prodigal comes home. So don't you want that for your life instead, to be motivated unto holiness by joy and a life-giving relationship with God? You know, I was very much doing it out of perfectionism and fear of failure and fear of condemnation, you know, but God apprehended me and invited me dramatically into joy and it changed my life. And I still struggle with those things, but, you know, it's incredible how much he has liberated me and is still liberating me from it. Um, so continuing, 
when we realize this, Martin Luther had this revelation where, you know, when he suddenly realized, okay, it's by grace I'm saved, so how, how do my works fit in? He realized, well, I don't have to work for salvation. You know, I do need to, to love God and express my salvation. I need to obey his commands. And, you know, remember, as James says, faith without works is dead. You know, if you really have saving faith, it's going to express itself in works. And if you don't have any desire to work and obey God's commands, then you probably aren't really saved. You probably haven't really, you know, engaged in saving faith. So watch out for that, too. Um, and certainly, if you don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit when you do wrong, um, that's another warning. But what Martin Luther realized is, okay, well, I'm no longer selfishly working for my salvation. I can now selflessly, with agape love, work as a gift to God and his people. You know, I can engage in a true motive of love rather than simply trying to cover up my shame when I serve other people. And that's where the hiddenness of shame as a motive is really interesting because, you know, um, you can be in ministry and do all kinds of things. And as Paul talks about, you know, um, have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and speak in the tongues of men and angels and even surrender your body to the flames and all these things. But if you have not love, you're nothing. And so you might be doing all those things to earn your salvation. But guess what? Number one, it can't earn your salvation. And number two, you know, you're going to be a dried out husk pouring out and, and legalistically exhausting yourself and becoming like that poor older brother who needed the refreshing revelation from God that, you know, you are my son and all that I have is yours you know, and, um, and so we're freed by saving faith to work out of love, to labor out of love, to be free from the motive of shame and instead be motivated to do good things out of love. <laughs> How wonderful is that? Um, so <clears throat> a helpful thing to remember when you're confronting shame and choosing to turn away from it and instead be motivated by agape love. Remember this passage here. This is Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. And the prophet Zechariah is receiving this vision. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who were standing before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, See, I have removed your iniqui excuse me, iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. I like how Zach Zechariah, he's engaging in this. Not like the older prodigal brother, you know, but... Uh, the older brother, the prodigal son, but he's he's engaging in God's heart, saying, "Yes, you know, do this for do this for this brand plucked from the fire from this sinful man who is Joshua the high priest." Continuing, it says, "So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by." So they clothe him in these righteous, shining white garments. It's a picture of being clothed in Christ's righteousness, the iniquity being taken off, you know, the stain of our sin removed. And here's where I really think this is useful in dealing with shame. Never once does it say that Satan's accusations were wrong. He was speaking condemnation over Joshua the high priest. And sure enough, he was filthy, you know, he was sinful. And the thing though, is that Satan, you know, who, who was the accuser of the brethren, is confronted by the angel of the Lord who, you know, um, scholars often say that's referring to Jesus, you know, pre-incarnate Jesus, when it's that capital A angel of the Lord. He's saying to the accuser, and remember Jesus, you know, if this is Jesus, Jesus is the, um, the one out of the Trinity to whom judgment is appointed. Jesus claims that of himself in the Gospels. You know, all judgment has been given to the Son. He's the one who says, um, you know, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you, the accuser, the condemner, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? So it's not about who Joshua is. He's just a brand in the fire. But because God has plucked him out, you know, Satan needs to be silenced. Satan has no voice in condemning him. And then he's clothed in God's righteousness. So when you're tempted out of shame to hide from God, don't. Because he sees all of your sin. He sees the filthy garments you're clothed in. And he even knows the elements of truth in Satan's accusation against you. And yet he still loves you, protects you, snatches you from the fire, affirms you, clothes you in righteousness. 
And so why hide? Why cover yourself in fig leaves? Why try to work or measure up or anything like that? So um, as it says in 1 John 3.20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So confront the accusation knowing, well, yes, I am a sinner. Don't deny it. Don't blame others. Don't accuse others. Don't become embittered. Don't, don't try to find your way out through, through legalistic righteousness or perfectionism. Just say, yep, I'm a sinner, but God is greater than my heart, and I can resist the shame and the condemnation, and I'm, instead I can just walk in repentance and produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And God knows all things, so I can't hide from him. He already knows, and he has already judged in my favor. So search yourself out for shame. See where shame is causing you to do all of those things we talked about, blaming others or, you know, accusing others or uh, in, embracing in legalism. You know, check and see, are you offended when God shows mercy to sinners? Are you offended, um, you know, any time that... Um, other people appear to be um, receiving more grace than you treat yourself with. You know, um, these are ways in which subtly shame will change your interactions with other people and cause you to be bitter, cause you to be abrasive, cause you not to be loving. Um, and also check this, are you engaging in good works for your own salvation, as if for your own salvation, or to elevate yourself in the eyes of men or God or yourself? You know, um, because if you're doing it for any of those reasons, then then you need to receive more of the love and the grace of God. And you can just invite him. He will show you those things and be genuine in your repentance and um, let him convict you. And don't be afraid. You know, don't run away because his kindness leads you to repentance and he disciplines us like children that he loves for our profit. So with that, Lord, we thank you so much for your love that is better than life. We thank you for your words of life that you speak over us, even in the midst of condemnation from Satan, but also condemnation from our own hearts. Even when our own hearts condemn us, Lord, we declare that you are greater than our hearts. And we receive your estimation of us. We receive your words of life instead of self-condemnation or shame or the enemy's condemnation or even the condemnation of others. We repent, Lord, of trying to earn our own salvation or prove our own righteousness. God, we depend on you for all of our righteousness. And God, we ask that you would, once again, as you delight to do, wash away our sins and restore to us the joy of our salvation, Lord. Even those sins that we wouldn't admit to ourselves or even to you, God, we present those to you. And we ask, Lord, restore to us the joy of right communion. Let us walk in the cool of the day with you, with all of that shame removed. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.